Cool, but we will try and try and pep you up with some um, fun hour we're talking about cleavages. Uh, I was joking about the scientists. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I liked it. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thanks, thanks to those who can join us. Uh, really looking forward to this session, um, the second in our, in our, in our series uh, looking at the uh, education device so we did lib dems last week we're on to labor next week but um particularly salient and the consultants so really great to have you join us here today um, my name is abhipas chari as you can see from my name tag uh, i am director of the social market foundation um i'll do a couple of bits of housekeeping and then i'll um pass on to rob to present his uh, fascinating fascinating research on the education divide uh, and have a bit of a discussion the panel uh, and then open up to q a so do sharpen up your questions um so in terms of housekeeping for those of you who are tweeting we are on at smf think tank um this uh, this event is sponsored by uk and changing europe so please do tag them in at uk and the at uk and eu or and um at uom policy uh, for university of manchester for rob um if there is, uh, if you hear a fire alarm, um, fire exit is out there on the right and all the people on the green signs. Um, you might be able to you might see the camera there that is uh, broadcasting live to the internet. So do be uh, circumspect in your comments. Uh, be, uh, be, be aware that um, a record of this will, will, will live online forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, really keen to get into this, uh, this discussion about how education has roiled our politics in different ways, how the divide between graduates and non-graduates has opened up, um, whether Donald Trump was right to say how much he loves the lower educated uh, and whether that constitutes a viable political strategy. But um, Rob is the expert, so I'm going to hand over to Professor Rob Ford, Professor of Political Science um, on home turf here, because he's from the University of Manchester. Uh, to summarise uh, his research and what the implications might be for the Conservatives. Uh, thank you, uh, Avik. Um, so yes, this is actually a question in, in various aspects I've been looking at for many years in my research, but I'm now producing uh, a, a new report, uh, looking at it again in depth for, for the SMF that will hopefully be coming out uh, later on in this autumn. And the starting point for this report I love graphs, so you're going to see a few, <laughs> is, um, well, here is the graph for Conservative support. Let's just start with that, Conservative conference. Um, you'll see that there is now a very substantial education divide in Conservative support. Before 2016, uh, education did not tend to be really a very significant predictor of Conservative support at all. Um, this is data from the British Election Study Internet Panel that surveys people on a regular, about once every once a year or twice a year, um, all the way through the past decade or so. And you'll see that post-EU uh, referendum, there has been a very consistent tendency for school leavers, that's people who have GCSE level qualifications or less. So they leave school at the first age that they can at 16 and with exit qualification. Uh, they're supporting the Conservatives, except for that blip around the tail end of the May government in 2019, it's generally 50 to 60%. Um, people who stay on school until 18, generally A-levels, but other kinds of qualifications too, Conservative support around about 40%. And then amongst graduates, Conservative support has been around about 30% and actually <coughs> steadily declining more towards around 20% in, in recent years. A near mirror image has opened up on the Labour side as well, with one significant difference, which is that it began, the, the divide opened up about a year earlier, and it opened up around about the time Jeremy Corbyn uh, became uh, Labour leader. Second slight difference is that graduates and those who stay in school uh, until 18 do A-levels and similar qualifications tend to be pretty similar to each other in terms of their alignment with Labour, whereas the big distinction is with school leavers being much more reluctant to vote Labour. And this is historically very new. If you were to look at um, data from 1979 or 1987, or even 1997, what you would see is that school leavers would be much more likely to vote Labour um, than graduates or 18-year-olds or, or either. Now, that dash line, I'm putting it in for a reason because, of course, Brexit is one very important driver of this recent shift. 
uh, even before the EU referendum was conducted, there was a clear and really huge education divide in people's views about how they would vote in an EU referendum. From the first time that the BES asked the question, you would have about two thirds of school leaders saying they would vote leave and about one third of graduates saying they would vote leave. And you can throw pretty much anything you want into the statistical blender with this and education will still come out as pretty typically the strongest predictor of Brexit views, not just voting, but also views about different aspects of the Brexit process as well. So the Brexit divide is first and foremost an education divide. But I think it's very important to emphasize that Brexit is itself a manifestation of something deeper in terms of how education structures people's identities and values. So it didn't create this divide, it just became a particularly strong political expression of it. So, for example, if we look at social identities, such as national identity, you see very, very strong educational differences in these. Um, here, I'm showing two red sets of bars on the left show the share identifying as very strongly British. They're given a scale of one to seven. How strongly British do you feel for one to seven? This is the share who say seven out of seven. And then for England, the share who say seven out of seven English, and you'll see much higher proportions of school leavers, the darkest bars, saying that than graduates. This is a slope as well, so the A-level people tend to fall in the middle. And then on the far side, this is the share who identify at least modestly as European. So it's not quite the same scale because European identity is not as popular as national identity as we've seen quite a bit. And that's actually not unique to Britain. Uh, so this is people who say five out of seven or higher European. And there you get the inverse pattern. Um, Plurality of graduates say, yeah, I feel at least a little bit here, uh, whereas very few school leaders will say that. We also see it on another aspect of identity that has always been very salient in political debate, which is class identity. So the share of people who self-identify as working class is much higher among school leaders than it is amongst graduates. Uh, a large majority, in fact, of school leaders self-identify as, work, as working class, um, whereas the share identifying as middle class Middle class is a less popular identity across the board um, in Britain, actually, um, but it's most popular um, with the university graduates. And interestingly, if you put both education and actual class, as in the jobs people are actually doing, into a model, education is basically a stronger predictor of people's subjective class identities as occupation. It's so clearly people are seeing this as an important sense of what working class and middle class means uh, in Britain today. Values are also an important part of this, not the traditional economic left-right values that are uppermost when we see, for example, arguments about tax cuts on public services, but instead the liberal authoritarian values that we see coming to the fore in discussions about things like crime, uh, things like social order, uh, things like uh, national culture, traditional values and so on. Here in Britain, as in basically every other country in the world, in huge number of surveys, there's a very, very consistent pattern, which is that the strongest predictor of those kinds of values is almost always uh, education. Um, the other strong predictor uh, tends to be age. And I believe Robert Colbert was talking about the age divide. This is one of several ways in which age and education overlap uh, as divides. So you'll see here school leaders much, much more prone to say young people don't respect traditional values, schools should teach obedience to authority, the death penalty is appropriate for some crimes, and so on. Now, if we think about the sort of process by which voters make decisions as a kind of funnel, so you start with this sort of fundamental worldview and orientation that informs your values, that then goes in to your political priorities, the issues that you want to focus on come polling day. And here too, we see substantial education divides, in particular, and I did this analysis before the recent discussion began about net zero and so on and so forth. There are two issues that are kind of like mirror images uh, in the education fight. On the one hand, immigration is an issue where you see very big divides between uh, different education levels in terms of their views of the issue and its effects. And critically, you see that people on the kind of migration skeptical side of the debate, the school leaders, tend to really emphasize it as an issue that matters a lot to them. That's salient for them, it's high priority. The environment is exactly the other way around. So you'll find that there is a greater degree of, say, climate skepticism amongst people with lower formal qualifications. Not, it's not a huge difference, but it's there. But the critical thing is 
the university graduates are much more likely to say this is a priority for me. Um, so just as for Labour, the problem with immigration wasn't that there weren't people out there who shared their view on it. The problem was that the people who shared their view on it weren't prioritising it. The problem for the Conservatives was something like their recent proposals on net zero is the people who might sympathise with that they are actually focused on issues elsewhere, whereas the people who don't like that, they're really focused on that. So it's, it's a tricky one uh, right there. Now, I want to say a little bit also about demographics, because one of the really critical things for, the, uh, for the, the politics of this long term is that the electorate is changing. Um, uh, and that change, though it's slow, is really, really substantial. If we go back to 2001, two thirds of the electorate uh, were school leavers with GCSE less, uh, qualifications or less than only a fifth were graduates. In the most recent census of 2021, 40% were school leavers and over a third were graduates. So those groups have gone from very, very lopsided. You know, if you were running an election campaign in 2001 and there was an education divide, it's pretty clear which side you'd want to be on as a politician. Now it's less clear, particularly when we also break it down by age. So again, this is where I would very much agree with um, Rob Colville. Um, you know, one of the strongest predictors of voting choice right now is age. And one of the reasons for that is amongst people aged about 50, 55 or less, graduates are the largest group. Amongst people aged 50 to 55 or more, school leavers are the largest group. But that will change over time. Um, now, how is all this cashed out in terms of votes and seats? Well, here's a graph showing how the Conservatives have performed cumulatively since 2015, so the two post-Brexit elections put together um, against the share of graduates within a seat. And what you can see is there's a really strong relationship there. So the places with the fewest graduates are the places where the Conservatives have really surged in the post-Brexit elections. Whereas on average, in seats where there are 40% or more graduates, the Conservatives' vote now is lower than it was in the 2015 election. So what challenges does this pose for the Conservatives going forward? They really have, and you know, this is a kind of repeating theme for the Conservatives on lots of fronts, the 2019 electorate is very heterogeneous, the 2019 coalition. So balancing the different demands of that coalition is really difficult. They have this big influx of socially conservative school leader voters, but they came in in 2017, 2019, particularly over the issue of, of Brexit, and keeping them on board is hard. So far, immigration has proved the most potent way of doing that, but the problem they have with immigration right now is that voters are sceptical that the Conservatives can actually deliver on their priorities on that. But the other side of the challenge is that the Conservatives' longer run really have to, to reverse their decline amongst graduates or they're going to face a serious uh, electoral um, problem. And the third problem that they have is that what we've seen in the past couple of years uh, a colleague of mine, Jane Green, likes to talk about this in terms of tribes and tides. The tribes that divides like this, divides over identity, divides over uh, education, divides over class and so on. And tides are the things that wash in and out and affect everybody. The tide has gone out for the Conservatives across the education divide in the last couple of years. They've lost ground amongst leavers and remainers, amongst graduates and school leavers. But that tribal divide by education has remained intact. It isn't the case that Labour have built a coalition that have closed that gap that have opened up. It's that they've banked their advance amongst graduates while also advancing amongst everybody uh, as uh, voters have become unhappy about performance on things like uh, the cost of living. Now, the electoral dilemma in 2024 can also be sort of illustrated in a different way, which is the Conservatives have to defend not just on two fronts, but against two different parties. And if you look at the share of graduates in seats and look at conservative marches, these are seats with conservative majorities of less than 25 points. So ones on current polling would be vulnerable. In the seats where there are relatively few graduates, the opponent is nearly always Labour. But in the seats with the most graduates, the opponent is more often than not the Liberal Democrats. So two different challenger parties in two different parts of the country with two different sets of priorities. A very difficult strategic problem for any party. And then longer run, the other problem is that the seats themselves, like the national population, are changing. In 2011, 486 seats in England and Wales had um, a population of an electorate where school leavers outnumbered graduates by more than 10%. That figure had already fallen to 284 by 2021. It will carry on falling steeply. Whereas the number of seats where graduates are a larger electorate than school leavers, that was only 
50 seats in 2011 census. It was already 150 seats by the time, 145 by the time of the 2021 census, and that number will keep growing rapidly as well. And these are figures that require some hard thinking if you are the party that is on the school leader side of that education divide, because the battlegrounds you'll be fighting in will be very different in future elections than they were now. Um, that's it for me. Uh, if you found that interesting and you'd like to read some big books, then there's two up there that I can heartily recommend. Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and for immediate reaction, as uh, not to despair, <laughs> um, I'd like to pass over to uh, John Oxley, who, if, if you're not familiar, is a uh, brilliant uh, commentator and uh, documentary of the, of the political travails of the Conservative Party and what gives you a to make that. And thank you for that very flattering introduction and for being here today. As you might spot, I was a, a, a last minute substitution, but it is a pleasure to be here. Um, and you know, I think it's really interesting to see this laid out um, because it's one of those things that I think if you look around politics, you feel, but it's very good to have the data there. And I think the question that comes to my mind when I look at this is, do young graduates hate the Conservative Party or does the Conservative Party hate young graduates? Because um, they offer them nothing as policy position and they slight them off all the time. And you look, I think, really interestingly at the sort of things that affect, in particular, younger graduates, but really most graduates under 40 or even 50, where you have a much bigger cohort, um, the younger sort of decade of graduates will pay a higher marginal tax rate than almost anyone else, particularly if you're under the post-2012 tuition fee scheme, you are effectively paying sort of an additional 9% tax. So if you have the same income as a non-graduate, particularly, for example, shall we say an older non-graduate who's renting out a house, you'll be paying a lot more tax on that if you're a graduate. You will also be paying a lot more for your housing because you haven't been able to buy property yet. When you get a little bit older, you're going to be paying a fortune in childcare. Um, and so you don't really feel like you're getting much from the government. And then you have a lot of stuff on these cultural issues, Brexit being a big one, but a lot around immigration and the environment where the government or the Conservative Party are not just not on your side, they're saying things that are actively hostile to a lot of the things that you consider important and care about. And so it's not really much of a surprise that those people aren't voting Conservative because there's no policy offering and all of the messaging coming out of the party is, we don't like you, we don't like people like you. And you know, what we are seeing is, um, yeah, that rolls into this graduate demographic thing, it really rolls into age, and when you combine those things, it's massive. And increasingly, we are going to see that having an electoral effect, as in part of what um, Rob was talking about, in constituencies, it, for a while, it doesn't matter if graduates and young people hate you, because they all come out of university, they move to cities, they live like where I live in West Ham, in the sort of seats where Labour win by 40,000 votes. But what we're getting to the point now is these people are getting older, they're moving out into the periphery, and in the next general election, you're going to see it, the outer London seats, places like Chingford, and um, Wood Green, which is marginal, the Tories are going to get wiped out in a step further out from that, um, places like Surrey, a lot of seats that have always been Conservative are stereotypically Conservative, are going to be marginal or are going to be lost. And that's a big result of losing these better off people. And I think, um, you know, again, I was talking to, to Rob about this. Um, if you look at the history of the Conservative Party in places like London, places like Manchester, um, as those areas became more ethnically diverse, the Conservative ch chased an ever diminishing white working class vote. And it lost them a lot of areas that they once held in those cities. But it didn't matter because, for example, in East London, those people moved to places like Romford, 
which in the 50s and 60s were Labour seats and marginals, are now hugely conservative and will never go the other way. That process is now being repeated, but the problem is those voters aren't moving to Essex. They are ultimately dying or becoming the sort of people who don't vote because you can be really well supported by youngish um, voters who are non-graduates, they're hostile to immigration, say, but they are the least likely group to turn out. So it doesn't matter if they like you. Um, and that's going to, and so if the Conservatives don't change this, then it's going to be very bad for their future coming back from the next election. And I think also raises a really interesting question about you know, what is the Conservative Party about in its future if, you know, as you do now, you walk into a, you know, a finance company in the city of London and you speak to the under 30s and you know, the investment bankers tell you they'd never dream of voting for the Conservative Party. Um, you know, my background is in the legal profession. You, know, you walk into chambers where people are earning a lot of money, solicitors and people earning a lot of money. Our education comes from stereotypically Tory backgrounds and they're not interested at all. And either the Conservative Party needs to win those back or it needs to find a very big new electoral coalition because you know, even when it shifted around and it had the working class support you know, through the 80s, it could also rely on those graduates, those middle classes, um, and if that's not there, it becomes a really interesting and difficult electoral map to pull together. Um, but you know, I think I could talk about this for a long time, but I'm going to hand over to some of the panelists. But, you know, it is an existential threat for the Conservative Party, this change. Thanks, John. Um, so next we'll go to uh, Siobhan Arons, who is National Chair of the Tory Reform Group, which um, tries to argue for a one nation approach. Is there any hope, Siobhan? Of course, there is always hope. I think uh, that ultimately um, you know, parties win by being in the centre ground. Um, and so occasionally we just need to remind everyone of that and, and how to do that. And I think that um, one of the things as first and foremost an activist who's knocked on many doors uh, is actually just the amount of overall disengagement um, with, with people, particularly younger people, is in for many of us who are fortunate enough <coughs> to have graduated to work in, in a world which actually isn't geographically located in and of itself, it's actually quite wide, we don't see a lot of those actual connections with our community if geographically. We see it in a much broader sense. I mean, thanks to the smartphone, for example, and our social media habits as well, our connections are equally as strong wherever in the world as well as our next door neighbour, in fact, probably stronger. And I think that actually that's something that kind of all the parties haven't really recognised as they look at what is the offer and also what is it that in terms of should be instilled within all of us about the importance of actually being connected uh, to our communities politically and being engaged. Uh, that's not to say everyone should become an activist, although I personally think there's no harm in getting out on a Saturday morning in the freezing cold, knocking on a door or attempting to put a leaflet through a letterbox. Trust me, you do want to warm up your hands first because it can hurt. Um, but, but I mean, in a, in a really serious way, that that sense of connection and responsibility as well as opportunity to, to be engaged. Um, so I kind of look at the stats and go as a conservative, oh gosh, what is it that we should be doing? And as a, a centre-right conservative in particular, what should we be trying to instill within uh, the green benches, our politicians, our government to make sure that they are hearing? But I do also think, you know, it's on each and every single one of us as well in terms of what what is it that we should be doing, we should be engaging with. Turnout is so low in elections that it is really easy, actually, to turn around and uh, ignore the grass in some ways for too long. And then we end up in a situation that, that John kind of highlighted. So I want to always kind of put that out there and I guess that's my pitch in particular to anyone who's watching the live stream and the fact that this will be uh, available for time in memoriam that it's not just about what the government can do but it's also about what you can do as individuals as communities uh, to shape 
um, the future. I think it's so very important. But in terms of the Conservative Party itself, of course, we must focus on that centre ground. We must look at uh, those values that are so universal um, and so that therefore they maybe supersede uh, some of these uh, educational divides and, and actually address those core concerns for people. Um, taking something like immigration, yes, there are very many different ways to look at it. And as we can see from the data, we always trust the data, uh, it seems pretty uh, clear cut. However, I don't think it is. Because again, when you knock on a door and you actually talk to people, um, it's not quite so straightforward in terms of how they feel about immigration, their concerns, their worries. What, they're, what they are focused on, for example, is what's going on. Do they feel that that is impacting the availability of jobs in their area, for example, or an impact on housing or an impact on um, you know, school places? And so it's addressing those things directly to making sure that there is a balance that actually it's not about your educational divide. It's really about, do I feel like the government is hearing us, their policies are both supportive and also welcoming. There are very few people who aren't actually open uh, to immigration. It's just the package deal that it looks like it's coming with. Is that having a hard knock on us? Of course I don't like it. Of course I wanna protect what we've got. But if actually, we can demonstrate the value of that, that it doesn't come with this um, you know, loss, that, that there is a much more openness to it. Um, you know, and just as much, I think, in terms of uh, our environmental commitments as Tory Reform Group, we absolutely uh, want the government to always uh, continue with the commitments that have been made. And um, if the only one follows us on social media, you would have seen our response uh, last week uh, to some of the announcements. A plug just to get more followers to uh, TRG uh, on Twitter, Instagram, <coughs> Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, all of them. Um, but, but really, I, I say this in the sense of it's always about balance. I know that that doesn't sell the tickets in politics these days, but it really is. It's about where is the consensus? Where is the give, the take in order for, you know, the, the maximum uh, possibilities and growth going forward? And it is about the nuance. Again, it's not something that is sexy and it's fun. And, you know, we like to uh, kind of take away uh, in this day and age. But I, I think that in terms of as, uh, we look to how can we engage with this growing, diverse, transient, uh, uh, graduate uh, class of people, um, that actually it's really, let's get down and dirty into the weeds and, and really start focusing on, on the balanced approach um, for intergenerational fairness. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> Uh, and finally, I'm going to pass over to Baroness Tina Stell of Beeston, um, an old friend of the SMF and the author of a great paper on the educational divide, long before Rob was on the scene. <laughs> so I wonder. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Vic, and for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, I, I suppose before I talk about sort of my paper um, and in the context of what Rob has presented, I think it's important to say that we shouldn't see the education divide as a choice, as in, you know, do we support uh, or do we try and uh, generate support from uh, graduates versus non-graduates? Um, and I think that it is critical, critical that um, we try and uh, address the divide that um, we're talking about today between these two uh, groups. And I say that, and the reason why I did a paper for the SMF about this a couple of years ago is because, um, you know, I really believe um, not just for party political purposes, but for society and our economic and our uh, economy, that we have to bridge that divide. And I think that we are um, doing ourselves a great disservice if we uh, if we don't do that. Um, I should also say from from the start that uh, I am a school leaver, as in I left school at sixteen, and um, I uh, did go to college, so I do have uh, A levels and I have some uh, technical qualifications too. But that was the end of my 
uh, formal education. But clearly, um, having been a former cabinet minister and held jobs in um, sort of lots of uh, uh, positions of great responsibility and authority, I spend most of my time and, uh, and are sort of very much on the other side of the divide, as it were, in terms of the graduate divide. So I, I see myself as somebody who um, straddles both, both sides of this equation, if I can put it like that. And what I tried to do in the paper that I uh, produced a couple of years ago um, was based on my experience um, and sympathy for an understanding of both sides of this divide is to try and sort of help explain where I think the non-graduates are coming from so that the graduate side could really understand and respond. Because as much as I share John's frustration uh, on behalf of graduates who may feel that there isn't enough being offered for them by way of uh, uh, housing policies and all that sort of thing. And clearly, that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, I think it's. Um, I think when I look at this uh, picture in terms of a more um, uh, sort of cultural type sort of topic, as it were. I think, and I think we need to prioritise um, the the, the non-graduate side, if I can if I can put it like that. And this education divide uh, is is both education in a way. It's not this divide is not really about qualifications at all. Um, it's it's a proxy, what I call for um, respect. Although I do think the kind of differences in educational attainment that we now see, as in the sudden increase of graduates over the last uh, 20, 25 years, is, is partly a cause too. Because what, what we see now in, uh, in politics, in business, in the media, is that most people in these uh, positions that uh, are decision makers or influencers of one kind or another are usually graduates, even if they are from a wide range of different uh, social background. So that's part of what's driving the cause. But I think what um, has happened because of that is that um, a sense that qualifications are the main measure of what main measure we use to judge people's value and worth. And, um, and when we think about the non-graduates, there's a tendency for those of us in the graduate side, and I'm going to call myself a graduate for the purposes of, uh, of this discussion. We tend to think that the reason why they may think differently is because they don't understand enough, that their problem is their lack of education. And, uh, and we have a perception too often that the non-graduate side of the equation are not successful because they haven't aspired to success like we uh, enjoy, or they are incapable of, uh, of achieving that kind of success. <laughs> uh, and when, after 2016, you remember there was a, a phrase that uh, got banded around quite a bit, which is, you know, these are, you know, we talk about left, left behind towns, which do clearly exist, but we talk about left behind people. And whilst there are some people who um, would feel very much like that, there are also people on the non-graduate side of the divide who are very successful, they are contributing, they are playing their part, and uh, we um, have sort of uh, um, dismissed, in a way, their contributions to what we sort of collectively achieve or, or enjoy uh, economically, and they feel that they are being sort of disregarded. And when they try and argue their position on, on big contentious topics, whether it's about immigration or it's about net zero and so on and so forth, that um, what they say is perceived as somehow um, either, in the worst case scenario, sort of you know uh, uh, driven by some kind of um, you know, bigotry, or uh, you know in the in the context of something like net net zero, because they don't understand sufficiently the sort of technical um, requirements of, of all this sort of thing. So um, what I argue in my paper is that um, I think if we are going to try and bridge this divide, and I do think this does relay into a uh, political uh, context as well, is that we have to not <coughs> only judge qualifications as people's measure of, um, uh, of worthiness. And, um, and I think the thing that we have lost and which we need to try and get back to 
is promoting what I talk about as uh, common standards or universal standards. And I don't mean the sort of the, the type of things that um, would um, cause people to groan and, and think I'm talking about something sort of, you know, which is harking back the past. What I'm trying to do is say things that are uh, what I call char character credentials, the sort of things which all of us who are trying to be successful, whether we are a graduate or whether we are a non-graduate, are critical to our success. <coughs> the basic things, the very simple, but like, you know, sort of promoting things like punctuality, reliability, um, the fact that um, these are, these, these manifest themselves into behaviours that allow us to generate trust between ourselves. It allows us to look at other people and think that we know if, if we are a non-graduate and we're looking at graduates <coughs> in decision-making positions who are grappling with very complex problems, that um, the complex solutions that we don't understand and are never going to understand are ones that we can accept because we have confidence in the way in which um, these people conduct themselves that they are motivated in the same way that we are, who are trying to succeed, trying to achieve and succeed in our own way. So, um, I, I there's, there's sort of lots more I could go on about, but I, I just think that for me, this is you know this this sort of the, the need for us to look beyond qualifications as measures of people's value and worthiness in terms of the contribution <coughs> that they are making is critical if we are going to see that divide bridge. And I do think uh, politically and electorally, these kind of common standards are important to people, whether they are graduates or non-graduates, or whether they are in seats that are becoming increasingly dominated by graduates or the other way around. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, lots to chew on there, whether it's the existential threat to the Tory party or uh, trying to um, sew our society together and, and heal some of those divisions. Um, I am going to get out of the way as, as quickly as possible and throw open to questions for you so we can get as many questions for the audience because I'm sure there's a lot to chew on. Um, yes, Hi, I'm Vivian Stern from University of UK. Thank you so much for this absolutely fascinating discussion. I guess I've got two questions. One is, um, really I guess for Rob, when you look at the way this divide appears in the US political system, it feels to be much more extreme. And I think that um, the, the, the you know, it, it's been, it seems to be quite a successful wedge issue, which is then actually perhaps there's a bit of evidence that it's starting to drive individual behaviour, you know, choices about whether in fact to go to university or not start to be kind of a little bit influenced by the way that um, higher education has been used as a wedge issue. The, the, so I'd like your reflections on that. And then the second question, I suppose for everybody is, if you, if you listen to the discussion about higher education in this conference, it's pretty resoundingly negative. You hear about, I mean, the, the, leaving aside the science side, where I think there's an awful lot of positive, you know, positive reference about the importance of research. Um, but on the higher education side, what we hear is poor quality universities, you know, rip off degrees, um, you know, that sort of narrative. Um, does it work for conservatives? Does it, is it energizing a base? A base? Is it going to be electorally effective to keep bashing away at too many kids going to universities? Uh, any others? Jonathan. Uh, yes, Jonathan Thomas, I'm a migration researcher at the um, SMF. And I suppose I was wondering, again, unfortunately, I look at everything through the, the, the lens of immigration, and I've written hundreds of pages, way more than the big light on how the fact that the Tory policy is, is you know, relatively open and actually is not that different to the Labour policy. And it seems a lot of what's happening at the moment is uh, mm -hmm. things being accentuated for, for political purposes. And I suppose my question is, how much is this sort of driven by the fact that we are, without prejudging the result this year, <coughs> in the kind of a late stage of a party that's been in power for a long time and has to, has to kind of keep staking out these seemingly more and more extreme positions with which polarise, you know, opinions as they do so, and could some of this effect maybe be reversed or at least diffused a bit, actually, if the Tories were out of power for a decade, people saw that the Labour policies were not mm. that different, and indeed the Tories had to see how they were going to maximise their base, you know, to get re-elected, so I suppose could, could, it, could there be a reversal, if, could, could there be an improvement for the Tories on this if they were 
uh, out of power. Uh, and thank you. Thanks. Um, I was interested in the Rob and John's points, in particular on the values aspects and then the geographical changes that have gone on with young people. Um, after the war in the US and in the UK, economic considerations were often the main thing in elections. Are we simply in an era now where people are prioritising social issues over economic mm -hmm. ones? The reason I say that is often when I hear people think about how do we win graduates over, they talk about monetary issues. And it does seem we're in a social issues era. I just wanted what your thoughts were on that one. Um, and then on the, the point that John mentioned about the countryside, particularly around London, with the sorry shifters that are going on. Is there, you know, is there an opportunity in the cities as a result of people moving out? That there could be a conservative regeneration in the, in the areas where perhaps those people are leaving could it in fact flip on its head. Thank you. Uh, Rob, where do you want to start? Um, it's, a great, it's a great package of questions. Um, I'll try and be brief um, on all of them but, but uh, give a decent answer as well. On the US uh, it is worse there um, but the reasons for that are part of a much broader narrative of hyperpolarization in the US, which basically incorporates everything at this point. Uh, it, it, from a political science perspective, it's, it's been kind of becoming a uniquely fascinating and troubling phenomenon. So the fact that you're actually seeing it influencing behavioral choices with real consequences, like whether to go to university, is just another example of how extraordinary an outlier the US is. We don't have that level of polarization here. To give one example, John was showing me some, some polling that I think Lauren Common did just recently. Universities here are trusted and respected across the partisan divide in a way that is, has no longer, is no longer the case in the US in the past mm -hmm. five to 10 years, which also informs the point you made about like, you know, is trashing universities a vote winner? Um, on the whole, no. Um, because British voters tend to think the university system is good, they tend to think it would be nice if their kids could go to university, they don't tend to buy into this argument which we've been hearing ever since Kingsley Amis that too many people are going. Um, uh, they obviously do buy into the arguments that the other side of the educational story is being neglected and that's also a story that goes back a long way. But it's it's not a uni bashing story. I don't think that that is, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that that's a particularly good strategy. Could the education divide weaken if the Conservatives go into opposition? I think very plausibly, yes, um, because uh, you'll have then a kind of graduate heavy party in power. You'll have a rather different narrative. And the Conservatives, I mean, you know, oppositions can oppose in lots and lots of different <coughs> ways without having to worry about, um, you know, the, the, the policy and governing consequences. So, on the other hand, if we look at the you know, uh, apparent uh, runners and riders who seem already to be thinking about running for the succession. Some of them look like people who would be potentially trying to polarise further on this dimension. So the jury's out. I certainly think that it could be something that could close again. It's closed before in the past. And then values and geography, is this another manifestation of a sort of general shift towards more of politics being about a kind of social values? Divide what I mean, I could do another hour on that because that's a big topic in my line of work at the moment. There is evidence across lots of countries that we do seem to be seeing a kind of tilting of the political axis of competition away <laughs> from the old questions of class and tax and economics and the role of the state towards a very different cluster of issues. So you're right, Britain is not unique or unusual in this. We might think it is because of Brexit, but actually you see it in many, many countries. It's true. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to deal with your first question because mm. it's just not my area and I won't embarrass either of you <coughs> answer. But I think in terms of the negative things about university, I absolutely agree with Rob. You know, everyone thinks fewer people should go to university until it's their grandkids going to university. Everyone thinks we should stop having crappy courses at crappy universities until we say the course you did at your university is a crappy one. I think absolutely there are actually some policy things you could maybe get into about course very high dropout rates and you know, because you know, in everything in every public service the bottom 20 percent could be made better and we could talk sensibly about that but i think overall it is a very bad rhetoric thing and it doesn't 
he, he doesn't really win votes. Um, I think your point about can this be fixed, well, it, my sort of answer to that is what the hell are the Tories going to do if it can't be? Because you, know, you look at the way the demographics are shifting, they're going to have to do something about it. It needs to be reversed if they want a path back to power, realistically, because there are going to be so many points <coughs> in um, so many seats. But I think, you know, for example, if you compare with the run-up to 1997, the numbers are so different and you look at the demographics, particularly on age, you know, it is, I, I, I was tweeting about something this uh, recently, in 1997, about 27% of people between 18 and 24 voted Conservative, and they are now polling 15% in that demographic. It is a huge, huge difference. It is a, it, even if it is a loss on a similar scale, where it stacks up and where it looks like that, how do we get that is going to look very, very different. And on the point about economic versus social, what I think has changed more is actually how people are conceiving the economic issues. I think it's a lot less about tax. It's a lot more about other things. And so the Conservatives have really got that. I think if you're um, a graduate professional, say, and the government's taking about 30% of your income and you're paying 40% of your income in rent or 40% of your take-home pay, you're looking at those and you're not that angry about tax, you're not paying those tax rates of the 70s and 80s where it, you know, income tax was hitting you know, over 100% in certain brackets. Um, you're looking at, at your rent and you're like, I'm paying 40% and I'm not even getting schools and hospitals for that, it's just going to a landlord. So I think... I think there's a discussion there. I mean, there's a lot of research on this, but my argument is the economic view has changed. Um, I think the cities thing is really interesting. I think when you look at the cities, the big question for that is um, how do the Conservatives break into um, ethnic minority votes? Because that the big issue is in that is the biggest demographic in a lot of these inner city seats. And you know, in some ways, there's an opportunity there because. Um, there is probably more alignment on some of the really socially conservative stuff that um, people are saying, but that's an interesting thing, how you sell that. And again, it goes back to your mm. other point. Those clusters in the inner city generally are going to be economically very close to the Labour Party most of the time. Um, has it flipped enough to pry them away? It, it was done in the sort of red wall in some ways. Could it be repeated in inner cities? Maybe it's, the party capable of doing the work to get to that? Um, I think that's an even bigger question. Can I, can I just uh, jump in briefly? I mean, I, I, I definitely wouldn't encourage or support or agree with trashing universities, okay, for sure. Um, but I think what a lot of people, uh, a lot of parents are concerned about is if going to university is the only route to their child being successful, particularly if in doing so, they're gonna get riddled with debt that um, you know they're not going to be able to shoulder, and and it comes back to then you know the point <coughs> that John was making at the start. You know they're going to be even worse off. You know and, and being able to get on the housing ladder and everything else is, is going to get more difficult. To the question about um, migration and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and you know and difference between Labour and the Tories, I I think that um, you know it's really important that that 2016 in terms of the referendum, that was that was a that was a you know a call for things to change. You know, that was a plea from those who were voting uh, to leave the European Union it was, it, that things had to be different. And it was a verdict on all of us, whatever side us as politicians were on of that particular um, uh, you know referendum. Um, and I think that what the Tories will be judged on next year is whether or not they have made things change sufficiently on some of these uh, important issues like uh, immigration. And if they, if, if it's felt that they haven't, um, then, you know, and, and Labour might be uh, in a position to do better than the Tories. And that's the big question mark, whether they're going to be able to do any better than that, I think, will drive people's um, voting intentions. But that's, that's the point that I think where, you know, we as a Tory party have not done enough in terms of you know meeting the expectations for things to have improved 
the people who were motivated by that um, for, you know, the people who caused this amount of disruption and that were capable of causing that amount of disruption at the ballot box. Can I just add one thing? Because I think it's really interesting, again, when you sort of compare with higher education, there's some great work in the FT this week that there's all this discussion about immigration and people say they want the numbers to be higher and then you say, do you want more doctors from overseas? They say yes. Do you want more nurses from overseas? Yes. Do you want more skilled workers from overseas? They say yes. Do you want to fill the labour gaps in low-skilled jobs and people from overseas? They say yes. And basically, it's funny, everyone's like, the government says one thing and does another. That's exactly the same as the public. They want immigration down, but they want all these people from overseas to come and work here because they, they do actually accept we need them. So, um, yeah, I don't know where you take it from there, really. Yeah, I think, I think that is really the point, actually, is how people feel <coughs> more so than, I think, educational divides, let's say. And I think that there are um, those uh, in, in certain areas, whether you're talking about in urban conurbations, in suburban ones and in the country who feel like they have been displaced, they've been pushed out, that the only option is university, for example, if we're talking about from an educational perspective, you know, that we have these like mass influx of immigrants type thing, you know, and they are great ways in which politicians can, and media as well, so I think we also have to bear in mind the role media plays in all of this too, you know, they're great ways in which to just throw things out, aren't they, and create these divides and these differences. Um, but in real terms, it's sort of, you know, is there the doctor at the GP surgery? You know, is there the person, um, you know, who's the school caretaker, for example? It, it, it's kind of, is there the opportunities for my children, for me, as I look at the next stage of my life? And and that is, is not a, a divide by education, but I think that how we address these things, how we look at them and, and, and we view them, is, is definitely different if, if we've had the privilege and time to, I don't know why I did it myself, you know, years in, in education, uh, leaving law school, and then you're like, right, great, the world's my oyster, so I'm, I'm viewing the world in, in that way. Um, and then I look at what do I want from a policy perspective, I want government to ensure that the world can be my oyster, that I can have all of these choices. And it's really a case now, as we take a step back and where we are in real terms is how then the government communicates things well. I think taking immigration as a good example, again, it's like throwing out the meat or the media picking up on a particular meet isn't the same as what's actually happening. Um, and so if we switch up our comms and focus on what is happening, what the benefits are, how we are, you know, ensuring we build communities and we sustain communities, that actually all of the rest is noise and that's not what we're looking at anymore. And that actually gets more people engaged in going out to vote at the next general election. Great. I'll take one more question. I think we squeeze one another the buzzer. So, um, this, I'm just trying to join up the dots for myself from a previous um, workshop that I've been to with Gillian Keegan, who was talking a lot about her support promotion of apprenticeships, and particularly apprenticeships for, degree, for degrees. Um, and uh, I, I just wonder if this offers the will offer in time, Conservatives enough hope and proof that there is more terms who've earned this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this aspiration opportunities for for people who want to take this to be course or want to just do it in a trend in another way. And uh, um, we'll supply the, 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 the gap in the market with the, with the trade. Yeah, I mean, this, this is one of my first objections to you is you've got degree holders and you've got school reapers and then there's uh, a big messy blob in the middle that we that are probably the worst neglected of all. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, and we, and we had this discussion in terms of I put them in. The interesting thing is they do fall in, in between. So you, some of the effects that, we're, that I'm talking about in terms of identity and values and so on, that those would still be there. Um, you would just have a group that's sort of not quite the same as graduates, but quite different to, to those on the 60. But there's, of course, a very different way of thinking about it, which is the way that um, Baroness Stoll has put so well, which is that it's to do with um, the degree to which these things are respected and the status that's accorded to them. And so I think on the one hand, having that kind of route would 
be great because it would provide people with a different route into positions of respect and status and so on. But on the other hand, that's premised on that route being seen in those terms. And that's always been the problem we've had in this country, is that routes that aren't university aren't getting the same level of respect. So simply just creating the route won't be enough. You need all of the institutions that basically react to the education system to invest in that route and take that route seriously and show that they have confidence in that route too. So I think it is an important idea. But it's not just a matter of making it exist, it's a matter of making it's it get the broad too. support. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, no, not only sort of big, big thoughts, I mean, you know, clearly <coughs> apprenticeship uh, degrees are, are a good thing, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of those. I mean, as, as I sort of said at the start, I mean, for me, in a way, this isn't really about. Um, education even though it's it's a it's a divide which exists between uh graduates and, and non-graduates and i i think that however many new routes to success that we create and they're all important and we have to have you know we we have to have people from all backgrounds <coughs> being encouraged to maintain their aspiration for themselves and for their children which is usually evident sort of from a very young age but starts to sort of dissipate when they can't see opportunities beyond a single sort of one that that in and of itself is never going to be enough if we don't understand what it is that is, is critical for uniting all of us across these different kind of uh, routes so that we can collectively um, work uh, sort of together and, and and actually tap into the the talents that people have to offer that are not necessarily graduates and um, you know and a bit of an advert uh, for my paper I'll, I'll, ta I'll tag it sort of to this um, uh, to, to the tweet on this um, this this fringe but one of the things I do in my paper is I try and set out um, the kind of things that um, non graduates bring to problem solving that uh, is quite different in terms of, you know, a sort of a mental approach to people who have been trained through university. And I know that because most of you are graduates in this room, if not all of you are in this graduate, and you probably think I'm talking sort of um, in a way that, you know, seems almost um, impossible to, to really kind of uh, appreciate, but it's, uh, it's true. And, and I think that, you know, this is why I throw it back so often to the, to the graduates sort of saying, we, we have got, we have an untapped source of um, uh, great um, um, sort of minds and contrib contributors in this country. And, you know, we need to make sure that we are using them. And I think if we can do that better, then I genuinely think that, you know, we will find ways forward, which is, you know, just, just um, sort of more sustainable in terms of bridging these various divides, dealing with the political question uh, or, or, or much else, really. Brilliant. Well, that's just that's us just hit 12. So we've raised some big challenges, both for the Conservative Party and for British society at large. But just to echo Tina's point there at the end, um, I think the first step is reading SMF papers. Uh, <laughs> we, will, we will take it. But all that's left for me to say, and, and we should start, well, start with Tina's paper. Rob's one is coming in, in, in the next few weeks. Um, so, so plugs for those. Uh, all that's left me to say is to say uh, thank you to UK and Chamber of Europe for sponsoring this. Thank you to Rob for his interesting research and sharing his insights. Thank you to the panelists um, for, for their reflections. And thanks to you. So enjoy the rest of your conference and let's see you around.